Hey everybody, this is Nick Apostolidis. I play Leon in the recent Auri 2 remake, and you're listening to Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. And welcome everyone to another phenomenal episode of the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikhail Casanova. I'm coming at you with another interview. And in today's episode, I've got the true honor and privilege of interviewing the one and only Jay Sandlin. Now, Jay Sandlin is many, many things. He's a comic book writer. He's a debut series over the ropes. And he's also the host of the phenomenal What Happens Next podcast and it's just such an honor to have him on the show the man's his knowledge on various topics from comic books to entertainment and more is second to none and i am so honored to have him on the show so if you are ready to do it i'm ready to do it let's go ahead and welcome jay onto the show All right, and welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikhail Casanova, and I'm coming at you with another phenomenal interview with the one, the only, Jay Sandlin. Jay, introduce yourself, man. (laughs) You're too kind. What's (laughs) up, Hawaii? Aloha and hello. Uh, I'm Jay Sandlin. I'm a writer, a podcaster, and I'm a dad. Usually I'm one of those dads that, uh, I don't know, or let me tell you, are you are you one of these dads? If you're a dad out there, do you let your kid watch things with a lot of curse words or adult content and just hope that maybe it doesn't seep into the brain? I, I'm, well, okay. When I was with my ex-wife, I was very cautious of that with the, the, her child, but she didn't care. And I feel like she's kind of paying for the repercussions of that now because her kid is hell on the wheels. But to each their own. <laughs> See, for me, I was the opposite. I was the kid that was sheltered from everything. You know, I'm in mm-hmm. Alabama, had very well, had very conservative parents and mm-hmm. was just so sheltered from everything that it made me go seek things out and learn to hide things from my parents. Oh, so yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. Well, you. Do, so I, I want my child to be open with me. Um, maybe we'll even follow each other on social media one day. Um, you can find me on Twitter at J Sandlin underscore W H N on Instagram and uh, Facebook uh, or on J Sandlin.com. I'm really, really working hard to build a, a good website. It's got resources for writers, mm-hmm. uh, including if you want to pitch your work somewhere, uh, I've got publishers taking open submissions. I keep articles on that on my website for, uh, the writer community mm-hmm. and my podcast, you can find on the website as well. Uh, my podcast is Jay Sandlin's what happens next. And I wish I could describe the format, but the only rules are you'll never guess what happens next. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, I hope you do. I hope you do. I don't know if you've had any a chance to check out some of it, but we um, usually uh, we started out bringing on professional authors. And, and that's still kind of the gimmick. We bring on published authors. You, you know, it doesn't matter what your writing is. Maybe you just publish blogs or maybe you purchase uh publish full-length novels but uh yeah that's we have a panel you know maybe three to four to five each show and in the past we've played improv games we've been like a whose line is it anyway podcast and that's been a lot of fun actually um you'd probably enjoy playing with us sometime if you'd like hey i'd totally be down (laughs) you're gonna you're going to come play uh, one of them that we like to play is the ABC game where like, let's say you and I have a conversation. Mm-hmm. We say one sentence at a time, but the first letter of what we say has to start with uh, a B C, you know, alphabetical order and so on. Yeah. You want to try it? Hey, I'm all for it. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. So the way it would work is this. We'd be like in a scene and let's say based on this wall of awesomeness behind you that we're in a video game store and <laughs> We are waiting to buy the next super mega hit video game. What is it? 
Oh. ABC, right? Okay. No, uh, anything that, yeah, think of the game first. Like anything, any video game that doesn't exist, but like in your mind, you wish it existed. Ooh. I know what it is. It's the DC versus Marvel Comics, fully immersive VR video game. Both sides, DC versus Marvel. I'll start and be A. You and I will go back and forth. <clears throat> Are you going to pre-order the package with Lobo in it? Yes. <laughs> I was not ready. You got to do a B, man. You got to give me a B. B. Let's start over. Let's start over. I'll do it again. Okay, All right. Okay, I'll okay. be A. All right. Okay. I'm going to say, are you going to buy it the day it comes out or wait until the lines die down? Basically, there is no choice because this game is what I need in my life right now. So, yes. Can't you see that I need to go ahead of you in line? This is so important to me. I have nothing else to live for but this game. Don't you dare go and get in front of me. I was here first. No. Everybody. Yeah, yeah. Rock your body. I'm sorry. I was just listening to my music. What did you say? Can I go ahead of you? Fuck no, you can't go ahead of me. <laughs> God damn it. I am going to get the Lobo pre-order package that comes with Lobo versus uh, the Taskmaster if it kills me. Hell no, you're not getting that before me. <laughs> Iceman. Iceman comes with it too. He's in the game. Just deal with it. You're not getting ahead of me kids man think about the kids <laughs> all these kids that want to get this game and you're stopping them what's your problem look i was here first it's not happening deal with it maybe we can come to some agreement how about you let me get the first copy if i give you uh 50 bucks negative it's not going down like that no okay okay 100 bucks God, I forgot. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I'm actually... P, you're P. P. <laughs> Positively not. It's not happening. We're not doing that. I was here first. Deal with it. Quan Chi. Quan fucking Chi from Mortal Kombat appears in this game, and he's not even part of DC versus Marvel. That's how awesome this game is. Raiden is also in this game, and it doesn't matter. He's not part of either universe. But I'm getting this first. Sub-Zero could probably beat most of the X-Men. Don't at me. <laughs> T-Hawk. Wait, why am I going with T-Hawk? T-Hawk could beat all of them, and he's from the Street Fighter universe. No. <laughs> uh, I don't know who the fuck T-Hawk is, but Liu Kang could bicycle kick their asses right into Metropolis. Uh, Victor Van Doom could still beat all of them with no issues whatsoever. What the fuck are you doing mispronouncing Doom's name? You do not invoke his name. He will come out of that game and decapitate you. That's how realistic this game is. Oh, you gotta do X. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, Xavier from X-Men could mind fuck all of them and he would be the victor of all of it i don't know where i'm going with this <laughs> true 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 charles xavier's mind control powers would give him a huge advantage maybe you get to use them with cerebro in the game oh wait, wait, where am i at now yes. yeah i think i messed it up where were we <laughs> x q r x u v w x oh i should have been y i went backwards yeah. y <laughs> um Yes, you know what? Uh, when it when it comes down to it, I think I will let you go first. Oh my god! What am I gonna do with Z? Um, oh god! Zebras, okay, zebras. Thank you. That's right. That's that's racist. <laughs> All right, that was my Cleveland Brown. Hey, Peter. <laughs> Lois, 
I want to have caramel colored babies with you. Nah, that was more Forrest Gump than Cleveland. Sorry, I've been watching Family Guy on Binge on Hulu. Um, that was the kind of TV I was talking about maybe keeping from my son. But yeah, so that's basically what we do on the podcast each week. We also like to tell stories. Um, we will come in with a story prompt and we'll take turns telling the story. And when you hear the bell ring, ding, it's the next person's turn to take it up. So awesome. we've... Uh, yeah, we've actually had um, comic book legend Paul Jenkins has been one of our guests on the show, author of uh, – he's the creator of the century, author of The Inhumans, uh, of course, Constantine Hellblazer he wrote for years. He actually came on and wrote a Constantine story with us on the show. Wow. And that, that was a lot of fun. Paul was great. We've had uh, Rodney Barnes from American Gods. And then we um, we actually have gotten away from the improv on some episodes just to sit down and talk to some of these writers. Uh, most recently, we talked to J.M. DeMatteis of Marvel and DC fame for the wow. past several decades. Yeah, he went in depth to his origins and a lot into Craven's Last Hunt, his mm -hmm. uh, probably most influential Spider-Man title. Well, that's debatable. But uh, I'm a huge fan of Craven, so we're going to have him on to talk about some of his other titles again later. And I think right now, as this show is airing, we're airing a similar series with Stephen Grant, who um, is known for writing The Punisher in the 80s. And, and, so, yeah, and it's you, it's a not, niche show. Why? You are huge, mister. Well, it's a, it's a very niche show. You know, I mean, most people don't know the names of writers who write even some of their favorite comic books. Yeah. And I, I that's not exact. I write comic books as well. I've been writing comics professionally um a little over a year now. Mm -hmm. I decided in 2016 I wanted to try to give it a real go as a professional author. And I Man, I I thought it would be like, oh, maybe, you know, I'd write a book in a few weeks and then in six months it would go to like Harry Potter status and I could retire after they build my theme park in Orlando. Um, it's a rude awakening. <laughs> so that's why that's why I've tried to use my podcast and my website to provide resources for writers, whether they've been doing it a bit or if they just have no clue what they're doing. If they're just starting out, um, you know, maybe there's something for them with the podcast, the website or or whatever. Do you do any writing yourself? <laughs> when I was younger, uh, I'd say probably my late teens and my early 20s, I used to uh, write. I would write poetry. I used to write short little comics. I used to draw and paint. Definitely used to draw like uh, American style comics and uh, Japanese manga. But I love Japanese manga, but uh, I've never been able to draw. I just I write I, I write comic scripts, which is something that a lot of people, including myself, mm -hmm. have no clue how to do. I was actually hired to write my first uh, comic uh, based on I, I self published a novel mm -hmm. uh, back in 2017, uh, which I took out of print because I still had a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. And and then I started writing, you know, reviews and you know just trying to improve the craft. And I got hired to write my first comic for kind of like a startup group. And I said, thank you, uh, you know, for hiring me. Mm -hmm. And then my very next, my very first question was, do you have an example of what a comic script looks like? <laughs> I didn't have a clue what I was going to do. And, and I really, I really did. But you know what, if you get a chance, fake it till you make it, do your best to just jump, jump in the deep end and learn to swim. And it's okay if you swallow a little water. Uh, because I went looking for ways to write comic scripts. And you mm -hmm. know what the coolest thing about it was? What? There's no one way to write a comic script. <laughs> so you can't, no one can really tell you that you're wrong. Um, there are definitely some things you have to do. But mm -hmm. for me, it's really just a matter of when writing a comic script, I want to use as few words as possible. Mm hmm and I'm going to start making my scripts available online in the future as some of these works are published. Um, my first one is coming out with Mad Cave Studios in December. And it's been leaked recently on Bleeding Cool News, uh, the title. Mm -hmm. They haven't linked my name to the title yet, but uh, I'm, I'm over the moon about it. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, I, I think more people need to learn, learn about the... Uh, 
writing of a comic script, and I'd like to help do that. Mm -hmm. If you ever troll in Twitter and see me and just want to ask or ask if I'll look at your script, uh, I, I'm ha you know if I have the time, I'd be glad to. But I'd like to put out some resources there so I can help more people with it. Definitely, and you know, and I think there's in, in many aspects of uh, the content that we consume nowadays. There's a lot of people that just don't know, like, you know, when it comes to writers, they don't know the writers or the authors. When it comes to, you know, the animators and animation studios, they don't know that. They don't know the people who do the music to the content they love. They don't know people who do the voices. It's typically just, oh, this actor, oh, this movie comes out, and they don't see the behind the scenes and, and the teams that come together to to build that and that's one of the things like with my podcast with you know interviewing the voice actors has been very pivotal because a lot you know when it comes to like these animes or these cartoons and these video games we know we know the voices when we hear them but a lot of times we don't have a face to put to that voice or you're absolutely know right name, you know and a lot of people which is funny because like um i've had a lot of people that i know tell me they're like oh i don't listen to English dubs of cartoons or anime. I just listen to the Japanese subs because the English dub, they don't put effort into it. And I'm like, that's not true. That's really not true. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Absolutely not. So in any event, I, um, yeah, I, I just would encourage anybody who's trying to write just to go for it because the fear of starting is what mm -hmm. stops a lot of writers and then the fear of uh, finishing as well, because a lot of people just think, what if what I write isn't good enough? So I'm not going to finish it until I think it is. Mm -hmm. That's completely the wrong idea. Even if what you have sucks ass and you objectively know that it sucks ass, write it down and finish it. Get mm -hmm. from start to finish. Because something that I learned um, is that your first draft will usually not see the light of day. Now, now, after you get a little bit better, after you've know, learned what you're doing and honed your craft a bit, you only may need one to two to three drafts before something is ready. And mm -hmm. some of it can just be nitpicky. Um, I'm on my third comic book series right now, and it uh, it's not been announced yet, but it's double the length of the previous ones. So I'm having to plan economically like, okay, this uh, section here, I've got how many total pages left? what needs to happen a b and c mm -hmm. and i always outline before i write that's something that's debatable some people say i don't outline i can't outline i write by the seat of my pants and, and we call them pantsers uh, mainly because they're yanking down other artists by the drawers and just showing everybody our privates because we're all trying to do make keep some semblance of order but they're just running around yanking our pants around our ankles mm -hmm. I'm just kidding. I, I'm also a pantser <laughs> at times. Um, well, I, that's a question I get a lot. Do you outline or do you just fly by the seat of the pa of your pants? And the mm -hmm. answer is absolutely both. Um, your outline is not any kind of holy writ or sacred document. It's a working outline. So, and once you're working within your outline, mm -hmm. you're going to find that you pants some of your best stuff just from you know out of nowhere. Because you've you've built the sandbox, and then you get to start playing in it a bit. So that, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm putting out about uh, 25 pages of script per week, maybe every five days, and it's going to be uh, 8 to 12 months before anybody gets to see any of those, which brings me to the other thing that every writer must learn, and that's patience. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know about you, but I'm not very good at patience. I'm not either. I tried. Yeah. <laughs> That's what stops a lot of writers when their stuff, you know, maybe uh, I actually had a writer ask me for advice on a submission mm -hmm. that he was sending in, you know, it's like a 10 page sample. And I stopped after page three and wrote him back and said, you have my notes. I didn't go any further because, you know, you've got some major issues and here they are. Mm -hmm. Work on those and, and then I'll come back to it. And I recommend you look at these resources, articles, and books. Mm. So then I kind of waited, and I'm like, his reaction will tell me if he's somebody that's going to be a writer. If he responds with, you know, F you, it's great, this is good, I don't need to get any better, then he's 
probably never going to get any better <laughs> because he's, <laughs> if you can't if you can't take feedback if you can't take criticism which is not to say that all criticism is valid mm -hmm. uh, you know some people are just looking to bring you down look out for those but if somebody who has no real reason to be bringing you down and who is you know there to find someone like that to read your work to really tell you the truth about it and then you'll be able to see what you can't see yourself and you'll get better so yeah I, I was happy to say that person had a great reaction and said thank you that was just the kind of feedback i was looking for so i wish him all the best just like i do all the writers listening there's there is always going to be work for everybody in writing because you can either find it or you can make it yourself that's what I'm working on right now. I'm working on work for hire and I'm working on a creator owned project as well. Wow. So how do you pace yourself if you you're putting out that much a week? Yeah. It how just means you need, well, it just think, I just think, okay, I need about seven pages per weekday. And then I only need about three and a half to four days of the week to write it. So it's just a matter of finding the time. Mm -hmm. It's also a matter of learning when you work best as a writer. Um, Cause I used to try to stay up really late to write mm -hmm. and I got various results doing that. I've now learned that I write better in the early afternoon mm -hmm. to mid afternoon. So being that I'm self-employed, I can kind of set my schedule around that and I try whenever I can to write during those times. So it's about picking your time, picking your place and setting a goal for yourself. If I'm writing prose, you know, like a full length novel, which I've been mm -hmm. working on. Oh God, I, I've been working on this uh, sci-fi novel for the last 18 months off and on. I'm still, I'm still working on it. I've written, I, I've written it, but I'm having to rewrite it, redraft it. And I'm having the hardest time picking it back up again because of the the work for hire, the stuff I'm getting paid to do with a deadline. Mm -hmm. So as far as pacing myself, I just have to figure out how much can I write in the time I have in the time I've set aside. Mm -hmm. When I'm writing prose with the novel, I usually want to either write or edit, whichever one I'm doing, mm -hmm. um, one chapter or 2,000 words. Because mm -hmm. my chapter pace is about 1500 to 2500 words so i i like to get away with doing a chapter per session if i can mm -hmm. and when writing comic book scripts i'm usually going anywhere from five to seven pages per session um because your brain does not have the creativity in a single day to do a lot more than three to four hours of yeah. real creative work like yeah. creation yeah. and i don't recommend just doing more unless you have to for some reason Hopefully you plan better than that. And you don't have to. When I, the first podcast I ever edited before I got very good at editing, th this is a question for you too. Okay. It took me about six to eight hours a week to edit uh, a 90 minute podcast is what it was at the time. Now I've got it down a lot, <laughs> but that was one that really took up my nights for a long time. I've, I've been there when I first started. Um, I used to, when I first started, I actually, because I didn't understand, like, the whole concept of, like, leveling the audio and, you know, trying to cut out all the popping sounds and if there's any, like, silences, I used to just record and upload. And I got a lot of feedback. Well, negative, but I, I, I view it as constructive feedback because, you know, there's almost positives in almost everything. I had to challenge myself to learn how to edit quicker and more efficiently because outside of this, like doing podcasting and YouTube and streaming, I work a full-time job. I'm a, a telephony analyst for a hospital. So I'm working six days a week, 15, 16 hours a day. So I'm like, it's hard for me to try and schedule much outside of that on top of having a wife and family. So it's like, how can I do this quicker? Okay, well, if I have a holiday coming up and I got like three days off. I don't mean one, to interrupt you, but I really hope that's not your thinking for the wife part of this equation. No, no, no. 
No, she's usually in here with me. <laughs> oh, kinky. Hey, hey, here's what it is. <laughs> but um, no, if, well, those, if, if those walls could talk of your podcast studio, every every podcast nerd's dream is just to kind of like have their significant other on their lap or massaging their so shoulders while they're doing it. <laughs> you know how many times that's happened to me? Zero, though. I, I don't get the podcast massage. I'll probably have to hire somebody for that. <laughs> does, does anybody offer that like on Fiverr or something? Podcast massages? Uh, dude, I wouldn't be surprised what you can find on Fiverr. <laughs> it's the dark web Fiverr. It really is. <laughs> they call it low Fiverr. <laughs> if you don't get it, if you don't get the job quick enough, it gives you a little message that says too slow. <laughs> I'm going to use that in a story sometime, low fiver, where they can just find like some real seedy work. It's like, no, we got to go to low fiver for this job, guys. Come on. <laughs> this is what you used to be able to find on Craigslist is now on low fiver. <laughs> so do you like to read comic books? Um, I used to when I had more time. Um, I used what to did you used to read? I, I think the last thing I used to read, the last comic I was really into was the Logan series. Oh, good choice know, old man logan so I oh i love I, I love old man logan actually i think i i this, this may be blasphemous but i i kind of like old man logan sometimes a little better than the mainstream because he comes yeah. across to me as a lot more he's got the wolverine qualities you want but mm -hmm. he's also very humbled yeah and he's he's just a little softer and in that sense he's more relatable yeah or maybe that's just because i'm getting old <laughs> i've crossed the point in my life where i'm going for the old folks products now you know mm -hmm. i might as well start buying dengue and pulling pulling my socks up <laughs> oh bro i already did that in disney a month ago oh are you serious i i can't lie world i was the dad in disney walking around with my socks pulled up and wearing crocs with mickey mouse shaped holes in them yeah I'm not proud of these actions that they came about as necessity. My wife lost the shoes that I meant to bring to actually walk around the park. So it was either that or flip flops. I mean, if you were out here in Hawaii, we'd say go with the flip flops because everyone walks around with them. I day. wanted to, but I had to have some kind of arch support. I mean, we walked six miles a day at Disney, oh I think. Goodness. Yeah. With a, with a five-year-old, I mean, I, I didn't really care what my shoes looked like until, oh gosh, my feet still hurt from that trip, in fact. But <laughs> in any event, um, what were we talking about again? Comics. Oh, yeah. I, if you So if you loved Old Man Logan, mm -hmm. I recommend you check out the uh, kind of companion series to it. Marvel put out Old Man Hawkeye. And it's a prequel to the old man Logan book where he goes after um, – he's going after Baron Zemo because Zemo caused like you know all these superheroes to die one day. Like he mm -hmm. infiltrated the Avengers, betrayed them, and Hawkeye knows that he's going blind, and mm -hmm. so he's going to go after him before he loses his sight. But Bullseye – is chasing him and bullseye is like a cyborg constable living in this like desert dystopia wasteland. It's like Mad Max. Mm -hmm. It's an awesome book and it is definitely um, Marvel after dark. I guess you'd call it mm -hmm. <laughs> adult Marvel. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I love my Marvel titles. I'm enjoying my DC titles, but now more than ever, I read titles outside of Marvel and DC. So you and I, I'm going to give you uh, some titles to read okay. um, outside of the big two comics. Um, let me think. Uh, I would definitely recommend if you like the 80s and action, um, there's a book called Deadly Class by Rick Remender about a school, for, a school full of assassins uh, in the 80s, like teenage assassins. It, it's like Harry Potter on crack. Let's just let's put it that way. It's the 80s, so it's cocaine. Yeah, Harry Potter on cocaine. These kids are going to the school to learn to be assassins. It's awesome. Check out Deadly Class. Um, if you're into science fiction, um, there's a company called The Vault. 
Vault mm-hmm. Comics. They have got uh, a title that's about to become a movie, and this is an independent comic company. I mean, this doesn't happen that often. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're getting Vagrant Queen uh, made into a, a TV series. So check out the book Vagrant Queen and look into the upcoming series. Um, Vault also has a great sci-fi title called Wasted Space, mm-hmm. uh, written written by a guy named Michael Marici, who is a super inspiration to me. I've been reading his stuff for years and trying to do quite trying to do almost as well as Michael Marici would be a, an accomplishment for me. You should have him on your show one day. He's a cool guy. Um, uh, <laughs> I've done pod, I've done podcasts with him here and there, but um, I need to get him on my show sometime soon. And then uh, I was also telling you about Mad Cave Studios. Mm -hmm. Mad Cave is a a new player on the block. They've only been around since 2014. Um, Released their first comic, Battle Cats, which is the flagship title. Mm -hmm. Uh, Battle Cats Volume 1, it's basically like Game of Thrones meets the Thundercats. And, And you've got these like cat warriors and medieval like bloodshed, you know, battling for the land and it's it's awesome. It's actually in volume two right now, but you can still get volume one and TPB. Um, if that's if that's your speed, also they've got a great book that I personally like from Mad Cave, is um, Knights of the Golden Sun, mm-hmm. and that is about uh, old. It's like in the Old Testament era. It's mm-hmm. it's not a religious book. It's just uh, about angels, demons, and other. Um, you know, kind of Judeo-Christian mythos. There's the giants, the Nephilim. They're all there in this period uh, during the Old Testament when it says that for about 400 years, God was silent. And this is the angels basically trying to keep order during that time of God's silence. So um, those titles so far uh, have all been by uh, Mark London, who is their CEO, and I I consider him a friend. Um, he's been on my podcast. Yeah, he's been on my podcast. I definitely need to hook him up for yours. Um, because he's got a lot of stuff coming out. I think he's, his next book is going to be called, uh, Wolven Heart, Mm -hmm. which is a Victorian age time travel book. And that's kind of all I know about it. I'm hoping I get an early copy so I can review it. Um, (laughs) but yeah, I'm looking forward to Wolven Heart a lot. So yeah, those are those are my titles, people. Definitely check out your independent comics because some of the best stories are being told by indie comic creators. It's almost like the Wild West of storytelling because you don't have the corporate restraint uh, that you would have with Marvel and DC. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I would jizz my pants at the chance to write Spider-Man. Or maybe I should say web my pants. <laughs> quit, quit, quit. <laughs> However, I would know going in, if I write Spider-Man then there are things I cannot do with Spider-Man. You know, I can't just say, well, hey, I, I think Spider-Man should have like a mental breakdown and, um, you know, eat nothing but jello for six issues. And they're like, well, that's interesting, Jay, but it's not really where we want to go in the direction for Spider-Man. So I'd have to, you know, work with those kind of constraints, mm-hmm. which is something you always do when you work as a work for hire. That's what I do for Mad Cave Studios. Um and I, I, my first series with them, again, that's coming out in December. Mm-hmm. So we'll talk about that another time. But what you can do as a creator is, much like podcasting, you can create your own comics and submit them to uh, publishers, if you like, who um, accept creator-owned material. And if they pick it, they'll let you continue to hold the rights. Mm-hmm. Uh, this has given us some of our best comics. Uh, one that immediately comes to mind is Spawn from Image Comics. I mean, we all know Spawn. Mm -hmm. Spawn is a creator-owned series that, you know, Image Comics puts out. Uh, Another one, are you familiar with a a title called Invincible? Yes, I am. I love Invincible. I have read Invincible from start to finish, all 150 issues twice now. Um, And each time I read it, uh, what, what I love about it is the foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. That's something that it's a uh, it's you know every writer probably thinks they do it, but it's actually very difficult to do it right. Mm-hmm. So Robert Robert Kirkman, who writes Invincible, he does foreshadowing right. One uh, good example is in the very first issue, 
there's a reference to a dragon controlled by a man. Mm -hmm. And it's just a total throwaway line. And then it had to be 50 to 100 issues later, they actually reveal there was something behind that. Like they had a story with the, the man controlling the dragon. And I didn't oh, wow. get that the first I didn't get that the first time I read the series through, but I got it on the reread. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's what he intended. He knew when you came back around to the beginning, you'd see where they mentioned it and you know it's coming. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. So yeah, Invincible is um kind of starts out as a teen book, but he grows up pretty fast in it, a lot like Spider-Man. He he's got like the powers of Superman for the most part. Mm-hmm. And he's, uh, you know, deals with a lot of questions that superheroes and corporate, you know, Marvel and DC comics don't get to deal with, but probably would like to, uh, like slavery, rape, um, the idea of, you know, am I really making a difference when I don't use my powers to kill? Shouldn't mm -hmm. I start, should I start killing the bad guys or not? Which, you know, that's a big question. Do you take the Punisher philosophy of justice or do you take the Spider-Man not only will I not kill Norman Osborn, I'll take a fucking bullet for him. <laughs> oh, man. I feel like I'd be somewhere in between. <laughs> Most people are. Most people are because you can see the danger of either extreme. And that's something that all the heroes kind of learn. But yeah, Invincible, Spawn, Savage Dragon, all those Image Comics guys who... I, I've got one that I'm working on that I would love to see on the pages somewhere. I do have a superhero of my own, and I've talked about him on my podcast before. I don't think people realize I'm actually writing a story about him, but um, his name is the Inferior Alloy Boy. Hmm. I, I'm curious. I want to know more. If you can share well it's all right so it's been kind of a j running joke on the podcast is how it started out um i for those that don't know i broadcast my podcast that sounded good i broadcast my podcast from a secret location in a shed in the mystic land of shortlandia where i am the chancellor for life it is a land that is a refuge for uh short people you know five eight and below maybe mm -hmm. Uh, if you don't meet the requirements, we'll still welcome you and, you know, grant you a day pass. You just have to leave by the end of the day. And if you don't, we're going to see you, obviously, because, I mean, frankly, we don't make ceilings above six feet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's I, I made up this this Shortlandia became a running gag on the podcast. And then I I said, well, the Shortlandia, you know, has to have a, a superhero. Mm -hmm. And I it just kind of was like off the top of my head, the inferior alloy boy is this hero who just kind of made like he's the opposite of iron man he grabbed some trash out of a dumpster and made a, an armor with it mm -hmm. but it's just really shitty like it keeps breaking <laughs> and he, he can't really defeat his, his arch nemesis is this uh kid down the street named cardboard kid who just plays with really sharp pieces of cardboard and might cut himself mm -hmm. um yeah, it's just it was just a running joke that and then I got to thinking like, well, what if there was like a real superhero version here of this character? What would it be? And I came up with like this kind of cyberpunk idea of, you know, how a lot of heroes get their tech and they're humans, but they put tech on them like mm -hmm. Iron Man, War Machine, basically all of them. Mm -hmm. What if he started out as the tech and then tries to work to become human? Kind of been done like if you took data from Star Trek and his quest to be human and just put that in the form of a superhero a bit. It's not terribly original, but something I'm playing around with. How's that coming along so far? Though? I mean, that one's on down the list a bit of what I'm working on right now. I've got some other titles that I got to get out first because um, I'm doing both. I'm, I'm doing work for hire. And for me, um, you know, I, I don't. I don't use this money to live on. Mm -hmm. I I've spent years building a day job to do that. So the money that I make from work to hire that basically gets invested back into writing as a business. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you are a writer, you are a small business owner. Surprise. <laughs> You're just making your own product every day. You're either selling it off to someone for their use Mm -hmm. Or you're owning it and people can essentially pay you directly for it. 
And today you have more options for that than ever. You can get your own work out by self-publishing and you can be in complete control of the process. You can decide the dates that it comes out, decide the artwork, the cover, uh, the content. Everything is under your control. You just have to think, how am I going to differentiate myself from the you know thousands of other self-published writers out there trying to do the same thing? So that's where other options for what's called traditional publishing comes in. And with traditional publishing, you sometimes uh, hire an agent. I've mm -hmm. hired two, and neither of them worked out for me well at all. I mean, I'll just be totally honest. The The first one worked with me for a month or two, three. She was very um, attentive to my work, I'll say that. Mm -hmm. But then she quits, and I felt, you know... I understood. I mean, she had reasons, but it was disappointing to have searched for an agent for so long and then have him quit after three months. Three and months. then, yeah, th three to four months of actual working, yes. But then her, um, it was her boss kept me on. She sent me an email and said, I'd like to keep you on. I like this book that you're working on. Um, this is a novel I've been working on about a cyborg gladiator in the future. And she says, I'd like to read your Cyborg Gladiator novel when you're ready. So I was like, hell yes. Okay. So I, man, I, I worked for months to make that book as good as I could. Because I was mm -hmm. like, this could be my last shot with an agent. This agent, you know, kind of inherited me. Mm -hmm. So I've got to make this really shine. And I did the best I could for the time. <laughs> and finished it. And sent it to her. And she never gave me a fucking note on it for nine months nine months yeah i'm not saying her name or anything because i mean we're, we're still you know friendly but it, it got to the point where i just had to move on um you know you got to be patient in writing but there's a difference between patience and no action you yeah. can be patient while the process is going but if the process is stopped you try something else and I'm the worst one, the worst person about keep uh, continuing to try things that just won't work because I'm afraid of losing what I have mm -hmm. or, or perceive that I have or could have. So I was terrified a little bit to step away from that agent and I went on my own. I hired a, an editor to look at the book because at that point I'd been, you know, on other things for a while mm -hmm. And that editor turned out to be uh, my new best friend and podcast partner, uh, Sin. And Sin is on retainer for me as an editor. She uh, helps me with all my projects. And we actually even created a, a series together that we're going to be shopping after the artist finishes some work. I'll tell you some more about that off camera. Okay. So I, it's all about the people you put around you with writing as well. It's You're running a small business as a writer. So... If you run it like any small business, you need to get employees that fill the, the right roles. And if somebody's not working out in a role, you know, it's you got to seriously consider recasting yeah. <laughs> like your Mary Jane and Spider-Man three. And oh, my God, I bet Kirsten Dunst wish she had been recast in that shit show of a movie. I'm not going to lie, though, I just paid money to rent it a few weeks ago. I mean, it was it was midnight. I was tired. I gave in and ordered the Spider-Man three. I, I'm not, I'm not proud of it, but I'm going to admit it. <laughs> oh man, I, I feel like I need to talk to you about business because, like, what kind of business? I, like, just in the okay. So, like, cause since you're an entrepreneur, so you understand like the marketing aspect of you know, marketing a podcast and your brand and, and uh, types of people you have around you because I'm slowly, slowly transitioning to doing podcasts and content creation full time. And I'm notice, noticing that it is very vital that I do have the right type of people around me that I do understand like how to use like social media in the proper way. And because you're also a social media influencer and it's, it's a journey of learning a lot. And I feel like in the last couple of months, I've just made this, this decision 
to go full time, and it really came after I went to E3. I got flown to E3 by a company called Vitrix. Awesome. And oh, sweet. It you know while I was there at E3, I met I networked a lot. A lot of people were like, oh, what games did you play? And I'm like, I didn't. I networked. <laughs> I'm trying to get my name out there, but it's like, you know. I, I feel like on this journey, like you got to have the right people around you because what I'm running into a lot now is people with a bad case of what I like to call the gimmies. And <laughs> okay. I have that, especially out here in Hawaii, like a lot of people are always asking me for something. You know, they're like, oh, well, this company sent you this for review. Or you got this, or you're making money doing this. You should give me that since you're not using it. You don't need it anymore. Or, you should bring me on to be a co-host or to to work with you oh, when you work with yeah. these companies. And I'm like... And, and, and what are they doing for you? Don't. Oh, there you go. I, I honestly would let, rather ask you about the business of podcasting because um, at this point... I've not really tried to make money with my podcast, not with this one. Um, since I started this podcast, it's not really about that. Mm -hmm. Some podcast might be trying to sell something, which is fine. You know, let's say that you're uh, you got a book. You know, I'm always going back to the books. Mm -hmm. There are bookstores and there are libraries. If you're a bookstore, that's awesome. I love going to bookstores. I love finding rare bookstores. Mm -hmm. uh, I almost bought one earlier this year. Or I guess I should say I was asked to buy one, but I did not want to make that kind of investment. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are a library, it's more like you're a resource for the public. Mm -hmm. And that's how I've seen my podcast so far. We're always going to be a resource for the public to give the writing public you know, a guide and maybe, if nothing else, just encouragement to keep trying their writing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that being said, I'm always open to expanding it in new ways to um you know if if I, i'm interested in what you know about making a, a podcast more profitable um honestly the most that i've found like in the ways that i'm making a profit off of my podcast is like the different companies that i work with like you know hyperx that sent me this microphone to use on my podcast so they paid me for that uh and then I love this microphone, by the way. And that's 100% real. I know a lot of people get products and they're like, oh, it's the best ever, and they hate it. Oh, no. Yeah, your your microphone looks sweet. I'm not just blowing smoke. And I, I, I'm i sorry I didn't turn my camera on tonight because um, I've actually got a bad case of, like, kind of allergy pink eye. So, no, no worries. Well, I'm not worried about it. But if you could see my mic, you would see, you know, it's covered in, like, duct tape. Um, <laughs> and it's... Serious? Yeah, I, I need to like use the force to will it to stay in its uh in its slot. I mean, this is this is the best technology Shortlandia has to offer now. But your mic is pretty sweet. I'm not gonna lie. What is that mic? This is the HyperX Quadcast. It's uh, a really good condenser mic. It's you can. It's Let's see. A, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a quick little ad roll for it, like just improv on the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> All right, let me think. Let me think. What's it called again? Hyper X Quadcast. The Hyper X Quadcast. A mic that looks like a sex toy and makes you happier to use. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry, man. They're never going to send you anything again. <laughs> Make sure you make sure you edit some good porn music behind me when you uh, when you edit that. That's a Ron Jeremy music going. <laughs> oh my god! But I mean, that's really like when it comes to making money. Like I, I just I work with different companies: HyperX, Razer, uh, Astro, uh, Vitrix. I get paid to either use their products when I'm doing YouTube videos or my streams on Twitch or if I'm doing my podcast and um, or I can just have stuff like, you know, my wife works with TechNet Sport with her chair. So I just have it in the background, you know, that's free promotion for them. And, you know, other thing is this affiliate links I'll leave in my podcast, you know, in the description or I started working with um, 
I got an invite to uh, Launchpad DM by Podcast One, and they're saying that you know if my podcast takes off more there, then they'll put it on Podcast One. Because so I was like, okay, cool. You know, if there's a opportunity for that, but I mean, other than that, it's just you know sponsorships from companies. That's the bulk of it. you know, and I turn down more than I accept at this point. Well, you should tell me more about that sometime because, yeah, I'm that's where I'm at a loss. I wouldn't know sometimes who to talk to or uh, where to go, but it's just it's, it hasn't been a priority for me. It's mm-hmm. been just about uh, creating the content and writing those 25 pages a week while trying to keep the novel alive. And uh, I also a really cool thing about mm-hmm. writing comics because I, I, I do love to write prose. I've got a short story coming out in, in an anthology later this year from D2 House Publishing with uh, my friend David Taylor. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping to talk more about that later. But uh, one thing uh, people ask me about working on prose or working on graphic novels and comics, and I like both. Um, I like how in prose you're the one in – the pilot seat, the commander seat, the captain seat, you know, you're the one making the look, you're making the images, you're having to write them, mm-hmm. but it's all you. You're you are both the artist, the dialogue writer, and the scene changer. Mm-hmm. Now with graphic novels, uh there's a huge difference between writing a graphic novel and writing a prose novel. You know what it is? Yeah. When you're the writer of a graphic novel, you only write for an audience of one. And that one is the artist. So if I'm working on, you know, one of my books right now, there's artists on them that I have never met. And I don't even have their email. I'm not even sure how to pronounce their name because, well, I'm I'm bad with names sometimes. <laughs> It's why I'm scared to say your name because I'm afraid I'm going to call you fucking Meckle again because it looks like it's written <laughs> Meckle. <laughs> but it's Mikal. I should put like a hyphen in it or something. <laughs> Mikal, Mikal, can I can I say your name in a silly French accent? <laughs> Mikal, <laughs> Australian Mikal, mate, Mikal. Oh, oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. See, I should be a voice actor. That's what I really should have done, right? <laughs> I would love to have been a voice actor, actually. I do some, I, I like to do voices on um, what happens next. And uh, one of my favorites is Skeletor. So, back to this, what I'm talking about with Skeletor. Let's say I'm writing a comic about Skeletor. Mm-hmm. If I'm writing a comic about it, all I have to do is tell my artist, uh, one of them's named Antonio. Mm-hmm. All I have to do is like, Antonio, in panel three, Skeletor waves his ram staff and says, Nah, 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 nah. I will destroy he man. Nah, nah, nah. Yeah, that's all. That's what he has to do. And then it's up to Antonio to show that to the reader. Mm-hmm. And then after that, it's up to Antonio's editor to sign off and say, yeah, you've shown this to the reader, what we want to get across, or, hey, you may need to change this here and there. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you an example. This is not a spoiler for one of my comics, but this is a true story mm-hmm. of the funniest um, editing error that we caught in a, a draft of this comic. It takes place, uh, this one scene is in Memphis, and I said, you know, exterior shot, early morning, cheap hotel in memphis called the heartbreak hotel every possible elvis cliche you can throw at this you know hotel Mm -hmm. and i give some more description and then the artist goes and draws it and the artist not being like a native english speaker he doesn't know the you know american culture behind elvis presley Mm -hmm. he just names the hotel elvis presley because i said it's an elvis presley hotel Mm-hmm. So he calls it Elvis Presley, not not knowing that's like, um, you know, the man's name. And then uh, the editor says, no, the hotel is not supposed to be called Elvis Presley. Call it Heartbreak Hotel instead of Elvis Presley. So we get the next draft and I fall out of my chair laughing for five minutes because this well-meaning guy actually put on the hotel sign in the artwork, Heartbreak Hotel instead of Elvis Presley. <laughs> It was like this long sign that had all of that on it. 
<laughs> it's like the joke when the cake, you know, someone's making the birthday cake and they put John beneath that Cindy. It was like the equivalent of that, but on a comic book. And I, I laughed at that for like five minutes. <laughs> So that's a bit of, you know, kind of how it works. You have to go through these various filters to get your story done. Whereas when you are the prose artist, you write your novel for everybody. And you have to figure out how do I help best take the reader to seeing what I want them to see. And at the end of the day, whether you're writing that for an audience of one, you know, the artist or maybe the editor, the letterer, the colorist, or maybe you're only writing it for prose which is any reader that picks it up it's your job as the writer to just make your story be seen don't tell your story i can sit with you and tell you a story mm -hmm. and maybe you know you'd enjoy it maybe not but people pick up their fiction to escape you know to go to other places yeah. that's why we that's why we pick up video games why we watch tv shows and our attention spans are so damn short that if you don't grab them and keep them there if they put you down, whether it's your novel, whether it's your comic, whether it's your video game, if they put you down, they are not likely to pick you up. It used to be that if I put a book down, I might pick it up you know, later again. Now, if I've put down a book, like uh, for instance, I've never missed a Star Wars novel in, in mm -hmm. years. But there are two times I've put Star Wars down and just went without it for a long time. And it happened with this Anakin Thrawn book that one of my favorite authors put it out, Timothy Zahn. It's Star Wars Alliances, where Darth Vader teams up with Grand Admiral Thrawn. Like, mm -hmm. Everything about that book should have been one that I've wanted to read for years. And I was so excited to pick it up. And I just couldn't finish. Just the book and I were not getting along the way I wanted. It was kind of slow for me. It felt like a, a detective novel more than the Star Wars action I'd expect, especially from a book that touts Vader on the cover. Because uh, Vader's my favorite in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Especially when he's just like this unstoppable force of nature. Like he is the dark side unleashed. You know, like in that last scene from Rogue One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to start like screaming in the theater. Like that's one of my favorite moments in all the Star Wars saga. I was going to ask you, like, what do you think of the new trilogy? Well, uh, good and bad. You know, here's what I have a problem. What I think a lot of Star Wars fans have a problem with, who can't stop complaining, mm -hmm. is, and I'm guilty of this. I'm 100 percent guilty of this. But the Star Wars trilogy was not made for old fans. It was made for the fans that are here now and growing up and still to come. They couldn't just go back and, you know, I wanted them to make Luke Skywalker the main character again. I mean, I'll be honest. That's what I was missing. Even if he wasn't the main character, just show him being active. Show him being this Jedi master, powerful, wise that we always knew he would grow up to be. And then we didn't get to see that until maybe a few seconds. And it was after we had lost so much. Like we didn't, we, we, we saw that Luke had just lost everything, which it's not, it's not what we wanted, but is it realistic? I mean, Luke at the end of Return of the Jedi had lost his father and touched the dark side. You know, maybe it was not the big victory that we all thought it was. And like the movie, and, and actually, George Lucas has said he doesn't consider it to be. And he considered that Luke went more to the dark side than he would have liked, but, you know, they had to sell some toys. So, so they made it a happier, happier ending. Um, so, point being, there are things I definitely don't like about the new trilogy, but. I am very hopeful. I'm I'm reserving judgment. I'm going to see what they do with the third installment here mm -hmm. because it actually might redeem some of what we've already seen before. I think it can be redeemed. It's like Darth Vader when we got to Return of the Jedi. There is still good in this trilogy. I know it. Help me, J.J. Abrams. You're my only hope. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, at least you're more optimistic than me. I... I, I try. I, I, I that last one. I was like, ugh, ugh. What did you think of the whole Han Solo movie? It was great. It. Yeah. Uh, I. 
I don't, I've never heard any legitimate complaints against it. Uh, most people I know like it and like it better now that they've had some time to, you know, kind of realize, Hey, this was good. Mm -hmm. It would make a great series in my opinion, uh, whether it goes on, uh, you know, in movie form or hell, it could go on Disney X. I mean, we, there's a lot of places for solo to continue and that's what Disney wants. People give Disney so much shit and I'm like, who makes better movies more consistently than Disney? I mean, you can, you can knock them for being the best at what they do, but there was a reason that the New York Yankees were the top franchise. I mean, there's a reason that uh, Hulk Hogan was wrestling for so many years because they, they do what they do and they do it well. You can mm -hmm. criticize them you all you want, but people who are like, oh, I don't trust Disney. Oh, I don't trust Disney. It's like, where have you been? <laughs> are you not seeing what they're there, – there are people who will complain to complain, and I have no room for them in my life. I don't engage with them. Um, you know, When I post something on Twitter uh, or Instagram, you, know, you talk about being a social media influencer. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're going to be on social media to influence, who do you influence by spending – most of your time online sitting bickering with over maybe you know politics or social justice issues you're not likely to change minds on twitter for people who are just looking to pick a fight so yeah. it's something that i don't engage with uh if i post something on twitter it's because it's something i like and i rarely when you're positive you mostly get positivity in return 99 percent of the time in fact I, if you want to be controversial, then just know that you're opening a door. If you want to, and sometimes if you feel like you need to make a stand and make your statement, fine, just be prepared for the reaction you might get. If that's, if that reaction is more important to you than just sparing your mental health, <laughs> because, because it can, it can really damage your mental health to just sit and invite, um, and I love a good debate. Uh, people actually who have listened to me on podcasts know that I love a good debate, but I don't debate people on the internet. Yeah. It's it's not one that it's not debates that anyone really wins. They just try to make themselves look better. So if you're feeding it, you're just feeding into an ego. Yeah. So I like to just I I just post the things I like, and uh, what I've been doing lately is I've got some themes for my days mm -hmm. that I try to stick to consistency because. Um, well, I, I like consistency. I kind of like what knowing what's coming next, even though that's the antithesis of my podcast. You'll never guess what's happening next, but I want to know what's happening. So um, I, I do uh, every Friday is Fantastic Friday, and I'll post something about the Fantastic Four. You know, ask a question. We talked about casting the Fantastic Four. We we talked about who we'd want to have at our back in a fight. Um, then Saturday I have batter day where I, I ask a question or say something about Batman. Mm -hmm. Um, this, this weekend I uh, was talking about Thomas Wayne as Batman. Mm -hmm. You ever seen the flashpoint paradox? No, I haven't. Or read it. I yeah. highly recommend it. It's on the DC universe app. Um, you can probably find it online some places, but yeah, I highly recommend flashpoint paradox. Great DC animated series. Um, that's something I'll post about just, you know, stuff that I like. I would, if people want to follow me, I don't know if I call it influencing. It's more about just providing a look into the things that I like. And maybe if like-minded people see it, they might like it too. So if they, if they like the things I like, I mean, it's my hope that they'll want to read the things I write and maybe check out the things I create like podcast or content or whatever. You have a hell of a following, man. I, I don't know about that. I mean, it's more about just interactions with, I, I don't consider it a following. It's just like-minded individuals who enjoy interacting. To say that they're following me isn't really, it, that would imply that I'm out ahead mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm really not. Like it's a current, we're all in the rapids together and sometimes things pass me by and then sometimes other things I pass forward. Um, there's, it, we're all connected in the great circle of social media. <laughs> Sorry. I just got back from seeing the lion King yesterday. How was it? I haven't seen it yet. It was great. Um, I, I prob 
No, I mean, it, it was the original. It just felt like a great a remake of it, and it was good in its own way. Um, I think it did what it set out to do. It mm -hmm. did not try to be very different from the original, which, if you want to get nitpicky, you could say maybe to its detriment, uh, because I thought with Aladdin that they gave more of an interpretation of Aladdin, uh, mm -hmm. but they definitely told their own story. It had uniquely distinct elements from the first, and I was hoping that Lion King would have that. Uh, in particular, there did, did you ever see Lion King the musical, like the Broadway show? Yes, yes. I saw it. I, I went to, I, I eloped in Las Vegas and bought tickets to the Lion King. Ooh. Yeah, man. So much of a rock star I am. Go elope <laughs> in Las Vegas, then go see a Broadway show about singing cats. <laughs> So, yeah, I was hoping they would have added some of the songs from the Broadway show, um, one mm -hmm. of which is Shadowlands, which Beyonce singing that song would have been incredible. Um, but no, I, I really liked it. My family liked it. My only my chief complaint about the new Lion King is I did not like how they redid Be Prepared. It was very short to the point. It was almost spoken with just kind of the music behind it. And I just did not like it. That's one of my favorite parts of the first movie. You know, with the hyenas come marching yeah. out, there's like an army of them. And like, I mean, Jeremy Irons kicked ass as Scar. I don't understand why he didn't get to come back. Um, if they brought James Earl Jones back as Mufasa, why not bring Jeremy Irons back as Scar? I, yeah. I don't see why not. So th those are my two chief complaints. I was, I was missing Jeremy Irons and I was missing the full on be prepared. But, Maybe they thought it would look dumb if real, you know, quote, real hyenas were doing that march high step like they were in the in the cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked to have seen that. <laughs> These hyenas out there marching like Trump supporters, you know. <laughs> what are your thoughts on um, the, you know, all the controversy surrounding the whole Little Mermaid uh, remake? So, all right, I, stage acting has been my thing since I was eight years old, and mm -hmm. I was in L A Little Mermaid. Um, I played, you remember her, um, The Sea Witches 2, Electric Eels, Flatsome and Jetsome? Mm -hmm. All right, well, we did like an off-brand Disney version of The Little Mermaid, so instead of two eels, we were two sharks named Riptide and Ziptide, and oh. I was, I played Riptide, I was like 12 years old, Mm -hmm. And um, point being is like our Little Mermaid was blonde. I mean, nobody cared. This is a very old story, The Little Mermaid, mm -hmm. adapted by like, you know, Hans Christian Andersen and others. It, it just to say that there's a definitive hair color for a fable, which yeah. is all Disney really does. Disney retells fables. Yeah. I, I don't give a shit if she has red hair or not. No, to answer your question. <laughs> and I, it's not something to go back to what we were saying before about social media influencing. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I will dedicate one second of my time to type a tweet for. Yeah, I, I, it's not worth my time to talk about. If it's something that's going to bother you and cause you to lose sleep, then I'm sorry. Find a hobby. Right. Exercise, exercise more. I don't have time to engage you about it. I don't care enough. Um, but no, I, I, it's because it, it's about the talents. You know, mm -hmm. the the image can always be changed. Yeah. But for people to say this has ruined my childhood, you need counseling, or your childhood was not that great to begin with. I'm sorry. I'll give you a hug if it helps, but I will not engage you in discussing the color of the hair for the little mermaid or whatever bullshit you're upset about this week. No. Does that, does that answer the question? <laughs> it, it does, I saw so many people upset about it. I'm like, and if you don't like it, don't watch it. I think I've muted or avoided those accounts at this time, which is another thing about social media. You are not obligated to interact with anybody. Yeah. Follow who you want to follow, block who you want to block, which is controversial of me to say, by the way, because the co comic book companies now have had to give actual policies on if you work for them, wh who can you block or what kind of practices can you use to block others? Mm -hmm. Most companies say it's your social media, block who you want, we don't care. Mm -hmm. But 
some have had to come out and say, well, you, you can't just block anybody who might be, you know, buying our product. Mm -hmm. And maybe they have an argument. Maybe they don't. That's up to the person to decide. I have my own opinions on it, but my opinion is I'll block whoever I want to because no one is entitled to interact with me. Yeah. Uh, social media is like a big room of people. You can choose, pick and choose who you engage with mm -hmm. in public. So why not on the public social media? Yeah, I agree. And to force you to engage with somebody in public, it would be ridiculous. So why do it on social media? So no, I, I don't let that stuff get to me. But uh, what other questions did you have? I want to talk about uh, your podcast. Like, and you're saying how it's doing so well on like Castbox. Like, I'm not familiar with Castbox, but let's talk about it. Castbox is a great app. Uh, we're actually talking about doing some live shows with them, which I am. I'm the one that's behind on getting that arranged uh, because mm -hmm. I, I'm. I've been moving. I've been on vacations, and I'm going to try to get something going maybe by the fall. We'd like to have a live show, but yeah, Castbox is just one of the many apps. Uh, I think our podcast should be available anywhere that podcasts are available at this point. Mm -hmm. or at my website on jsandlin.com. Um, find uh, the podcast by searching Jay Sandlin's What Happens Next. You know, make sure you, you put my name first or just search Jay Sandlin, and it, it should probably pop up. Um, okay, cool. Um, one of the last questions, well, one of the two last questions I have for you. Go for uh, it. So... Not sure if you've had to run into this. You probably have, but how do you deal with people that are say that like they're envious of your success or they make comments such as like you're so lucky or I'm so jealous? Like I get that a lot. I know it shouldn't bother me, but I get it a lot, especially out here in Hawaii. And it seems like it comes from a sense of entitlement. But do you get that or have you gotten that and how did you deal with it? I don't really deal with that now. Um, yeah, I, for me, I'm just kind of always looking forward. Mm -hmm. So if that's in my ear, if that's in my, it's so far in my rear view that I don't want to look back at that. Um, if so, I, I've not really had a problem with that because I, I decide who I engage with, just like I said. And that's why it's important to have the right people around you, people who keep you grounded and, you know, when you're doing the writing thing, you're getting enough rejection. You know, I, I've gotten two rejections this year and mm -hmm. I've gotten, you know, three to four jobs. So you would think, oh, I'm getting three to four jobs at a time to juggle. I mean, I've, I've, there's no way that I'm still getting rejections. No, I'm still getting rejections and I'm going to keep getting rejections. I think I've actually gotten four rejections this year. So it's, it's about 50, 50. Wow. And if a, well, if you're a batter and you're batting 50-50, you've got the best damn batting average in the MB in the MLB. Mm -hmm. I almost said batting average in the NBA. You see how much I play sports. <laughs> Point being is it's not it, it's very easy to be humble when you're a writer because you keep hearing no. So mm -hmm. it, it doesn't feel like that to me. Okay. I, I dig it. That I need to adopt that mindset. So I'm, I'm well, you're kidding. always looking. You're always looking forward to your next goal. What's your next big goal? What's your ultimate goal after that? What could you see this ultimately becoming? I mean, I I can see that in my mind. Um, you, whether it's a podcast that someone has, uh, a personal business, or maybe just succeeding in their current line of work. If you're setting goals, short, middle, med medium to long term, and setting achievable steps to reach them you're going to succeed at what you're trying to do. It's just a matter of time. I shouldn't say that it's too optimistic because some people will just never succeed. And it's not even always their fault. That's true. Yeah, that's, but true. that's pretty depressing. Let's no, ask a happy I... question. What's the last happy question? Maybe it's happy. Let's hear that question. Um, what advice would you give to fans in the audience here that would love to get into, you know, uh, being an author or, comic book writer or would like to get into podcasting or social media influence it's going to sound very self-serving but my advice is to just listen to my podcast and watch my website because the advice that i'm giving is all there uh, i'm making it available on my website i think if it's not there already uh, you should be able to find a section called writer's resources mm -hmm. and i've got some that are available completely for free 
And as I'm gathering more and more and working with a, a partner now, mm -hmm. um, we're going to be making even more available. Some will be free and some will be things that you uh, buy like a service. It could be um, interactive editing services, uh, mm -hmm. you know, providing feedback to writers about their work, helping them go over their submissions before they go blindly hitting submit and not having a clue how to submit, you know, to get an agent or mm -hmm. to be published. Things that I had no clue how to do and could have really embarrassed myself. Now, I mean, I already embarrassed myself by sending, you know, really shoddy submissions that weren't professional, but people expect to receive some of those and they shouldn't mm -hmm. because it's so common because there's nobody that teaches you just how to do these things unless you go look for it. So if you're yeah. going to look for it, uh, please come to my website again. That's jsanlin.com. J A Y S is in Sam, A N D is in dog L I N uh, follow the podcast, follow the website and you'll get the first notifications about when my books start to come out. Um, Mad Cave Studios is uh, who I've been writing for. Uh, that's going to have the first um, run with me in December. Mm -hmm. And then we'll add a second title in March that I've written. And then there's a third that's TBD. So you'll have to stay tuned on my website. Maybe I can come back here and, and talk to my friend Mekel, you know, as we call you in the South. Your name is Mekel. <laughs> Michael, can can I come back here and talk to you about these books I've been writing? Hmm? Uh, you sure can, sir. We can share some French fries and taters. Hmm? <laughs> that that's a Sling Blade reference, if in case y'all ain't seen that. <laughs> Funny, is that Billy Bob Thornton actually comes to my town every year for this film festival. Wow! And I've I've met him like a few times just in passing, and the dude looks old. And you oh. just look at him and you think, really. Angelina Jolie. <laughs> and with that, I'm signing off. So yeah, find me on Twitter at J Samlin underscore W H N on Instagram or Facebook and my website, J Uh, Mikhail, thanks for having me on partner. Man, I, I just had one. I lied. I have one last question for you. Go for it. Did you have fun? Yeah, I had a blast, man. I had a blast. <laughs> but it's getting late tomorrow's Monday and I'm thinking about how soon it's going to be that I have to wake up and I'm going to have to think about how I'm going to meet those goals this week. When am I going to write these seven pages and get my kid to karate camp between, you know, meeting work deadlines, you know, things I need to do to make the money to do the things I like to do. Okay. So if things are feeling um, overwhelming at times, if, you're someone who's a reader listener that deals with anxiety. I've also posted resources on what I did with meditation to, uh, to deal with that head on and always create an open dialogue. Don't be afraid to acknowledge and talk about your anxiety. And with that said, people, I leave links to all of Jay's social media and his website, as well as his podcast out in the description of the podcast and the YouTube video down below so with the, you'll be able to catch this episode of the podcast on youtube.com slash Mikhail Casanova as well as twitch.tv slash Mikhail Casanova and on all podcasts and outlets from Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio. Oh, what's the other one? What's the other one? Oh, come, come back. The thoughts there. Ah, Spotify. <laughs> Almost forgot. I'm not good at this outro. And all handy, there... at, handy edit button. <laughs> Jump cut. <laughs> and with that being said, people, we are signing out. Have a good one. <laughs> hey, did you enjoy this episode of the Casanova Podcast? Well, I'm sure you did. And since you did and you're wondering where else you can find it, you can find it on every podcasting outlet. Yes, it includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Launchpad DM by Podcast One, and so much more. And the only thing I ask of you is if you truly enjoyed it, even if you didn't enjoy it, please leave a rating and tell us what you thought of it, what you like, what you didn't like, and everything in between. And also, if you're looking for video formats of this podcast and many more, you'll be able to find them on YouTube.com slash Casanova as well as on Twitch.tv 
slash Mikhail Casanova and new episodes every single Monday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So, that being said, this is Mikhail Casanova, Hawaii's favorite YouTuber. I am signing out. You guys have a great one.